We are live. What's up, dude? Hey, man. I, I'm, I, I just had an idea, and I just want to sketch something really quick for myself so I don't forget it. I'm sorry. Just sometimes no, things awesome. happen, and you just got to you gotta let them roll here, right? Is this something you're going to share with us, or this is something for later? Just based on – before this, everyone, we were just I will share parts. this right now. No one will understand what it is, <laughs> but you might. But, um, and it's like just a quick idea, but that. Now that's like what big deal, right? Whatever. But to me, this this means something very interesting, um, and uh, we'll see. That's all. I just, uh, just want to like I just want to get that down so I didn't forget this idea. I huh? I might even have a an idea of what you're you're thinking of applying to that that too. Yeah. I'll, all right. Yeah. Maybe 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 in in a few weeks time show like I'll talk more about that. But it's just a. I'm working through, just to let people know, so we're, we're, people may have been watching already or not, we're working on a, a new version of Basecamp and I'm, there's like two sort of competing directions late in the game, like this is sort of how it just happens, two sort of competing directions for um, uh, the, the fundamental structure of something. And I'm trying to, there's good, there's, there's good stuff in both of them and there's bad stuff in both. There's tension and conflict in both of them. And I'm trying to figure out if there's a way to take some of the good from both and make it into something that's not a hybrid for the sake of compromise, but a hybrid for the sake of something comes out that's better than both. And that's sort of a really fun challenge is like, it's very easy to compromise. You've got multiple ideas and different peoples with different different perspectives. You're like, well, I like this thing. Let's just like, well, it fits over here. There's an empty space. So I'll just pop it there. But that's not necessarily making it better. That's more of a compromise. So I want to see if we can figure out a way to take the ideas from both of these designs and concepts and bring them together in a way that actually turns out better than either of them individually. So that's sort of the, the challenge that, anyway, that's something that's going on. It's interesting. And that's, so we, you know, you and I talked about maybe what, um, a topic we would talk about today, and that might actually be kind of interesting. Uh, this guy, Gerard Kelly, was actually asking us on Twitter, hey, Nate, in your product design experience, has there been a time where data has pointed you one way, but your gut says otherwise? And by that, I mean from a UI and or business decision perspective. If so, what did you decide and what were the results? Um, it, just you talking about the, the different, uh, what you're deciding here between these two different ideas, would you ever use data to, to, to help you do that? Or, you know, have you kind of defined some lines where like, you know, data is not going to change this decision for us because this is kind of like a belief that, that, I, that I'm not going to change? Um, you know, or, or, and do you have any examples? I mean, you just kind of yeah. quickly told me about an example where Data where you wish you had used more data, I guess, yeah. in your decision making. Yeah, we're kind of all over the board with, with data and decisions. Um, some stuff we're extremely data driven by, like performance, um, not financial performance stuff, but like server speed, database performance, application performance, like trying to shave off milliseconds, that sort of thing. Hugely data driven. We're also data driven by customer service in some ways, trying to get our response times down and that sort of stuff. Product design, a little bit less so, um, but. Um, one, one thing that, that happened recently, which is enlightening, um, we, we changed the um, Basecamp.com marketing site. Um, I'm not sure when this was, but it was many months ago. And we got rid of the, um, we used to have a sign-up screen. This may have actually been a year ago. I'm trying to remember when it was. The top of, the, top of Basecamp.com used to have a, a sign-up form that was visible. Um, so you can just sign up right there. We, at some point, replaced that with, a button that said sign up that was a little bit further down on the screen, but it was, it was a button which would take you to a sign up page. Um, and we're like, yeah, yeah that's, you know, it's just a button, it's a sign up or check it out, whatever. Like, okay. We didn't actually look at the results of that change, we just made the change. Um, we're just like, oh, let's just make the change. We feel better about it, let's make the change. Um, so we made the change and didn't pay any attention to the results of it because the numbers in general were still totally fine, like everything was fine. Um, but uh, a, a couple months ago, or maybe a month or a month and a half, I don't know, something like that, um, uh, Noah, who, who, who's sort of our, our data guy here, he was just looking at some stuff again. And um, he's like, hmm, something weird is going on with the marketing site. Like, signups are down. Like, what's, what's actually going on? Like, why are signups down? 
And we try to like, you know, could be this, could be that, whatever. And we kind of went backwards and found the point where the signups, and this is so ridiculous that I'm saying like we weren't paying attention to this, but I'm just telling the truth. So we weren't paying attention to that because the numbers were good anyway. Um, we're like, oh, maybe it's summer fluctuations. I don't, we didn't even think that much about it. But anyway, we extrapolated back and we realized it started happening when we made this change. Now, anyone who has like a marketing team or analytics, someone's focusing on analytics or a chief revenue officer, like they'd be like, something's wrong immediately. We just didn't do that. So anyway, we, 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 put the, we put the sign up form back at the top of the screen. We A-B tested it. Um, and like it was so clear that having the sign up form at the top of the page had a, a significant impact on signups in, in a positive way that it's back there now. And numbers are right back, in fact, better than they were before. Um, and uh, it's just one of those things, it's like so stupid. You look back at it, it, we lost, technically we lost a lot of money, long-term value of customers, like long-term, long if, you, if, you, if you do the math, we lost a lot of money on that, on, on that indecision, basically, and just well, actually on the decision that we didn't pay any attention to. And it's just kind of embarrassing and stupid, but it is what it is, and like you can't go, I'm not mad at anybody, we just didn't do it. Um, yeah. And let's not make that mistake again, but, uh, it is an example of us not paying attention to that sort of thing when we should and we had the data, we just didn't. And right. um, that, taught, that taught us a lot, I think. It's a, it's yeah. A yeah, and, and I'm a, for, for, for some reason, yeah, I don't, I don't really have any hard and fast rules, but like we, um, we want to like make a change right now, even to the button color on the high rise website. You know, right now we're using a, a, a shade of blue, green or something that like, I, I haven't been in love with, um, but we went with it, and now we've, we we want to just change these, this button color across the entire marketing site. And I and we were going to just launch this out, but it's but it's like no, you know what? I want to test this, and and now I'm like, has, I, I want to test this because when when I was fooling around with draft and doing some A/B tests, I changed the button color, just a button color, one button from green to blue for yeah. the like try draft for free or whatever it says. It had like a twenty percent change in conversion rate. Um, you know, it's pretty significant, uh, just going from green to blue. And so it's just like, yeah, it, it's crazy when some of that stuff can happen. So it's like, now I'm really hesitant to like, let's, let's test this change of blue. Cause I'd hate to lose like a chunk of customers just cause they don't like the shade of blue we picked for this button. Right. Yeah. There's, it, it's kind of amazing the things that move people. We did this, this is a test we did a long, long, long time ago, but we had some buttons. It's like sign up for a free trial. And then another one is just like learn more or something like that. Another one is like um, see plans and prices. And they all went to the same place. Um, and see plans and prices outperformed everything else in terms of click throughs. Because, I mean, we don't, you don't actually know why necessarily. But what, what you can infer, at least what we inferred, was that it's more information. It's, it's like it's very specific what you're going to get. Sign up for a free trial at that moment. It's like, well, I don't know what they're going to – I'm not ready to sign up yet. Just slow down. I'm not ready right. to sign up yet, which is funny because <laughs> – so we learned that at the time, and now we're learning that actually making it super easy to sign up by having the form at the top is actually hmm. – is what, is what people seem to want to do. That's interesting. But there's all these really interesting conflicts around this stuff. So it's not just like – you can't run a test and be like, this is the fact in every case forever. It's more like in this situation, for whatever reason – this is working better now. You can dig into why, but it could be in another situation. Like for example, in the other situation, we didn't have a sign up form, but we had buttons. Perhaps the C plans and prices button was the best implementation of the button idea, but actually having the form right there would have been even better. Right. So it's you know these things are it's not always so cut and dry in terms of like when you're testing things, you're testing one or two or three variations, but there could be a hundred variations and you've got to be careful not to go, this is the hard and fast rule all the time because what you might be testing is sort of a local maximum where you're figuring out the best version of the button version, but actually there's a much bigger leap you could have taken had you done this other thing instead. And, and like 16 years into the business, we're still learning this stuff, still figuring this stuff out and um, still making stupid mistakes. And that's just kind of how it goes because you're, you can't have your eyes on everything all the time and we weren't watching that. Yeah. Silly, did, would you did you say I, I, um, do you, the current version of the website with the form? Do you like that better than the old one or worse? Aesthetically, I don't like it, um, but that's not 
it, it, that's not the uh, current goal. Um, I, when we redesign the site, we will have a form at the top, and it will look aesthetically better. Because right now, the top wasn't designed to have a form on the right. So it doesn't work, in my opinion, aesthetically. But right now, it's the right decision to make, and we'll just deal with it and live with it. And it doesn't seem to matter a whole lot. I mean, it kind of matters to me, but it doesn't matter what it matters to me, really, when we're talking about these sorts of numbers. So um, I absolutely believe a form at the top can look aesthetically great. The whole, if, if, designed, if designed as a whole together, it can look nice. What we basically did was we shoved something up there right now and shrunk an image. So it doesn't like the, the balance and the rhythm and the harmony is sort of kind of off or whatever, but it, it's totally fine now. Um, Do you ever look though at like, I mean, so in the pro inside the product, would you ever make a decision on data or have you, I mean, would you ever, you know, you know, you, you, I think you've, you know, you've kind of been expressing that you're, you're trying to debate between two different layouts or decisions about, you know, what it's like to kind of enter into the next version of Basecamp. Would you try both and, and, and split test it to see if there's one retained customers better than the other? Yeah, uh, we could we could do that sort of thing. I mean, the the would trick you, is, is. I mean, do you want to, or would or you know, is that not even important to you? I think it's all important. It's just a matter of I think priority and and like also how quickly can you get answers. So something like retaining customers, um, you may have to look out years to see like if which cohort, you know, like and we're just not that sophisticated currently to really to want to do that right now. Um, I'd rather see if we can get to some quick wins, low-hanging fruit stuff, which there's plenty of it before we go down that road. Um, also, we have a very small team working on stuff. So to design like two distinctly, like radically different websites, copyright all of them, I don't mean copy, I mean like write the copy for all yeah. of them if the messages are different, the concepts are different. It's just, we don't have, Three, two or three separate full-blown teams to be able to implement that. Right. So um, we just have to do what we can with what we have. And right now that's about producing our best effort, single site, our best effort, and then um, A-B testing elements within that design. Um, ideally, uh, you'd have three or four radically competing different ideas that are radically different and see if there's really a, a big change there. But you know, then you also don't know exactly what it was when you when you're testing so many different radically different ideas. It's like, well, was it just the color of the, the button, you know, or was it actually the site, or was it the message or the head? Like, right. so I know there's multivariate tests. There's all that stuff, right? All the stuff is possible to figure out. Um, we just kind of don't aren't really set up to truly go down that road at this time with the staff that we have. And I'm also not sure. Like, I mean, talking about retention. So, like, I remember reading when I was. Um, thinking about launching draft, I remember reading some sort of, I don't know, growth hacking article or book or something that was like, you know, here you should, before you launch a product, you should set up, you know, a, some co cohort analysis and looking at retention and, and only when you achieve this retention should you launch the product. And it was like, I, I was, I, you know, I was looking at the numbers and it was like, it, it of course it didn't look quite as a pretty or as even expected as, as, as what, um, as, as maybe even what they would describe I would be seeing, but it was like, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like when you think about retention, it's like there's so much stuff. I could maybe add something that actually might show a, an improvement in, in, in retention now, but it's like, is it, is it really going to improve the product for the long run? Are people gonna stick with it for the long run? They might get excited because I've add, like I, I look at Basecamp, it's like you might improve retention if you add Gantt charts and I don't even know what else. Uh, right. Time tracking, I'm sure people are asking for like crazy. You might actually see a bump in that, but for the long run, like those then are maybe gonna be the first things that break because you guys don't use it. Uh, maybe retention then you know starts leaking out years from now because people are like, man, this product has gotten so complicated. I don't know, I, I feel like people, glom onto like those retention graphs is like the solution. Whereas like, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if you can really, it's not quite as linear. It's not really as, as mathematically um, formulaic as that. Um, there's so many variables and there's that, so many things. And I think it just comes down to, you can paralyze yourself with like worrying about all these different things. I think you gotta pick the things you care about and try and make those the best you can. And um, uh, certainly there's probably room for improvement in all these different dimensions, but I think a lot of it comes down to what's actually manageable and reasonable for your team and your company and whatever. And 
Um, I think there's also something to be said for like, I'm not interested in doing everything I can to squeeze a quarter percent more revenue out of our company. Like we could probably do that. There's probably a lot of things we could do to squeeze a quarter percent out here and a quarter percent out here. But like, I'm just not that hungry for that kind of juice in, in that sort of way. Um, I feel like if you're a public company and you've got to hit your numbers every quarter, like you're, you're looking for that eighth of a percent, you know, a few basis points here and bips there to kind of to hit that number. Like I, there's a ton of effort you can make to move the needle a tiny, tiny bit. And in some cases that matters. And in a lot of cases it just doesn't. So, yeah. um, I, I, I don't know. You got to pick your battles, I guess. I, I don't really, I don't know how, what else to say about it, but certainly there's money and opportunity left on, on everyone's table all the time. And you have to decide like what, what's worth going for and what isn't. And what, what are you conscious of the fact, like what do you know that you're leaving on the table? And being okay with that too. Like we, we don't have to grab everything off every table. Right, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. We had an interesting challenge the other day. It was, um, I think we even did this yesterday or two days ago, where we were debating We've changed the import uh, flow in high rise uh, just to try and make it uh, a little bit clearer, a little bit smoother, maybe even a little bit more modern looking. Um, but we've removed, I don't know if you remember, like in high rise, we, you, there was a bunch of links like import from Outlook, import from ACT, uh, import vCards. Yeah. I mean, some yeah. of the stuff that's on there is, is like ACT. I, I'm sorry, ACT, uh, but like I don't think that's even... You know, in 2006, that might have been popular, but yep. these days, I don't know if our customers are really kind of relating to importing from ACT right now. So, yeah. like, we were going to remove that, you know, from its very prominent location. And so now we're just kind of going with, like, import Excel, import CSV files, import V cards. But we've removed this import from Outlook link. And in, and in our place, we've put a little help file kind of link lower in, in, in kind of prominence on the page. That's it, like, need, you know, if you need help importing from Outlook, read the steps here. Because importing from Outlook is, is really just simply exporting from Outlook as a CSV or Excel file, and then using our CSV Excel import. But we were debating, like, do we even add the clutter to the page about importing from Outlook? And we debated and debated, like, is it worth it to people? But then that was a good one where it was just like, why are we even discussing this? I could go look at the at, at analytics. I mean, we're tracking all sorts of clicks and what people are doing. And so I, you know, I went in and it was like, oh yeah, 15 to 55 people a week are clicking currently on this help file about Outlook. So it's just like, yeah, there's there's a good chunk of people. I mean, that's a tiny percentage of customers, but there's still 50 people a week or need help about Outlook, I don't know. It's still kind of a gut thing, but it's just like, okay, that seems like enough to put that link still on the page as opposed to making 50 people kind of search around for help on Outlook. Um, so it's still kind of a gut, but I don't know. That was just kind of an interesting thing that we've made an analytical decision on because of our analytics. Yeah, it comes down to, so everything has a, can have a number attached to it, but um, what, what, what value, like what do you value, basically? Um, because you could you could attach the number fifty or hundred or five hundred to like all sorts of different links, and maybe there's thousands of people clicking this and six people clicking this, but those six people are your biggest customers. Like, right, it's, right. It's just, who knows, right? You got to attach stories to these to these numbers in some ways as well, and just to, so you understand like what's worth going for and what what isn't. So I don't. Know. It's an it's a constant. I I, I think that I think that it's just a constant. Um, uh, sort of realigning of like what you want to focus on now. So right now you guys might focus on that and then you might go, all right, we, we made enough improvements there and now we're going to go move to something else rather than saying like till the end of time we will improve this until we're 100% sure that it's exactly what we needed to do. There's points where you just kind of, you, you, you um, we're, we're doing this with, with Basecamp right now since we're, we're readying for a launch. Um, like there's a bunch of stuff we're going to release that, I know isn't isn't right yet, um, but it's fine, and it's not about it like being buggy. Like we don't want it to be outwardly. There's, certainly, there's gonna be lots of bugs that we miss. Like we're releasing a product with a huge code base, we're gonna miss some, right? Um, but there's certain things that like we've been using the product. This is kind of an interesting thing. I've been meaning to write about this. We've been using this new version of Basecamp for many many months now, like thoroughly, and the things we're bumping into. Our things we're bumping into because we're pushing it to its limits in certain areas right now. On day one, not a single one of our customers will be pushing anything to the limits. They'll be in a much, they'll be an introductory phase. They'll be like 
making their first project maybe, or even just taking a tour through it or just poking around. Like their, our concerns are not their concerns on day one. And so it's, it's tempting to feel like we need to solve for these like pro level edge casey things because we're bumping into them and we are. But re realizing that customers on day one are starting from scratch essentially, and they don't have any of these problems. Like there's too many projects in this menu, so like how do you get to them? Well, no one's gonna have that problem. Maybe for right. months, no one's right. gonna have it. We have it because we have like 80 things going on. But no one's gonna have 80 things going on on day one, day two, day three, 30 days, 60 days, maybe 90 days, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But like we're not gonna have those problems. Um, and so people are gonna be like, well, I've got all these things open at once. And like, well, I get it. Totally get that we're having that problem right now, but that's not a problem we need to necessarily optimize the solution for at launch time. We will have to get there down the road for more and more people, but we can kind of hold our own nose in the meantime and recognize that this is sort of our problem that nobody else is going to have for a while. And just trying to corral, like trying to make sure that that's clear, and it's probably not anywhere near as clear as it should be, but like trying to make sure, remind people of that, that yeah, we're bumping into rough roads in some areas. No one else will for a while, so we can put those aside. There's a story that we've told a few times. Um, it's been a while, though, so maybe these people, some people probably haven't heard it. Many people probably haven't. When we launched the original version of Basecamp, 2004, we could not actually bill anybody. Um, so we, we, we had pricing plans. You could pick those like nineteen thirty nine fifty nine 59 or something like that, right? You pick per month. You can pick these plans, and um, you could sign up and, like, be on that plan, but we had a 30 day free trial basically. So we didn't bill anybody for 30 days. We couldn't bill anybody for 30 days. It was impossible for someone to pay us for 30 days because the way we set it up. So we're like, well, at launch, we don't actually have to know how to bill people. We have 30 days to figure that out. Um, and I feel like there's a lot of things like that in the product today where we can have some time. We know it's going to be a problem, not a huge problem on day one or day 10 or day 20 or 30 perhaps. So we can get to that later. Anyway, it's, just, it's fun going through that, like reminding people that. Bumps in the road are okay if you're not going to hit that bump for 12 miles, you know? Yeah. So anyway. No, totally. And, and like we, you know, every day that this, it's, it's really easy. And you, you just even brought it up about like improving the, the local, local maximum. Um, it's so, it's so easy to kind of fall into that or get stuck on that. Like we're, so we're, you know, in the course of this, these import improvements, we've made a lot of big changes, but then there's a lot of little changes we've started to make. Like, you know, the email that gets sent out after the import is complete. If it's a really long, if it's a really big import and it happens asynchronously and, and, um, Chris Gallo, uh, my head of customer support picked up today. He, he, you know, he was testing this and he got an email back and it said he had updated his contacts, but then the email said it added contacts. And so I started looking at this just like, okay, well I could one, I could redo all sorts of logic in this email. Um, and, and kind of, you know, really figure out like, well, how many contacts did you update versus how many did you add and who were they? We could spell them out a little bit more and break them up a little bit better. That's a local maximum. I mean, I could improve that, but I also could just maybe fix the copy a little bit better, make it maybe a little bit more ambiguous. But in the meantime, I would buy myself all this time to work on these much larger projects that we have going on now. Um, I mean, it's important, these details, but it's just like there's a lot of stuff that's on our to-do list that people have been asking for that we want to do that would like give us like really big new superpowers in high rise. Um, yeah, but it's, but it's easy to, 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 keep working on the little details of the project and never get out of them. Like it just keeps going and going and going, but we've got to just like call it. Okay. Let's ship what we've got and we'll return to this when we get some other bigger things out. Yeah. And it could be a matter of timing too. And, and, uh, it's, this is one of the biggest challenges of product development, I think, which is that there's always more to do than you can do. Um, there are a dozen variations on everything. Um, there's always more polish you can apply to something. You can make that one word better, that one sentence better, that email clearer. You can do all these things you can and do forever, endlessly, like really. Um, I, I kind of think about this like with, 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 um, with people who are sort of obsessed with, with gear over the outcome of something. So like I've got some friends who are into photography and um, they're they're at the point in their careers now where like these little tiny, tiny, tiny details matter. Like, you know, they'll, they'll buy the lens. It's a thousand, it's a, like, you know, uh, 
whatever millimeter, I don't even know, like whatever the millimeter, 50 millimeter prime lens or something. And there's one that's like 800 bucks and there's one that's like 3,200 bucks. And they're now at the point in their career where the $3,200 lens does make a difference. But then I have other friends who aren't anywhere near that point in their career and they're obsessing over the $900 versus the $3,200 lens. It's like, you won't even be able to tell the difference. Go out and take some pictures. Like you should be taking pictures with this time that you're not, not thinking about the, you know, this, this type of glass or whatever it is that's different about the lens. Like, you know, so it, it just depends on like where you are in the product and where you're at and like how good the basics are and like where do you want to optimize? And it's, it's hard. It's a, it's, it's a, it's hard. And everybody on your team has a different, um, has different values. You may have share same broad values, but you have different individual values. Um, you have different individual levels of taste. You have different individual points of view on what's good enough and what isn't. Like, it doesn't matter that you're in the same company. You're still individual people. And so, like, there's no facts or right answers there either. It's like, it's just a negotiation. A pro product development is negotiation. It's ne negotiating with, with, with talented people about what is worth, what deal you're going to sign. Basically, that's kind of what it is. And there's a big deal for the whole product and there's many deals all along the way. And, you know, there's a bunch of compromises and things aren't always right. And it's just, it's, it's fascinating, but it, it just, that's what it's like. It's messy. It just is messy and because people are doing it. And anytime people are doing anything, it's messy. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Um, I think just coming to like, the that's a really great analogy. The way I think about it. Yeah. It, that, that camera is a great analogy. I actually, yeah, I, I'm also, um, yeah, it's something I, I, I think about constantly. I mean, you see, uh, Golf has been something in my, in my life and you, you constantly see people worried about like the, the, the details in their equipment or shoes or balls and it's just like, but guess your swing is terrible. You don't play a good round of golf. Like you don't need these things yet. Yeah. Um, and, you're, and you're right. Like it's like those details come into play when you have the fundamental things that are much bigger in, in, as part of your game and improved. Um, that's a really great way to think about it. It's a good, you good can't framework. even tell, you actually can't even tell the difference until you're good enough to tell the difference. Right. That's right. the thing. Um, you, you, ha you have to have already gotten to the level where you can even detect the difference. And uh, so, you know, anyway, we're a little bit off topic on that, but that, it, it, it's all kind of the same thing there. So it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a good topic though. But Oh, it totally is. Yeah. Well, um, we've got three minutes left. You want to, um, what, let, you want to end it with just even deciding? What, what do you want? This is the last day of our five days of, of chatting on a podcast. Are we doing... Yeah. Want to do every day next week, or do you want to do something else? Yeah, so I, I would like to continue to do this. Next week's interesting because we have um, uh, David's in town for a couple days in the beginning of the week, and we have some interviews with some people we have to do in the afternoon. Um, so it might be a matter of doing them earlier in the day instead. But I, I want to like I don't want to break the momentum because then we're it's easy to be like you put it off and you put it yep. off. So let's let's commit to doing them, but let's try and find a different time if we could next week. And it doesn't need to be the same time every day, but the first three days of the week might need to be like a random times. Like one might be 11 a.m., one might be 3, one might be 9 or something. Cool. Okay, but we'll do five. We'll do this. five next week again? Yeah, yeah let's, let's do it. Let's do five more. Sounds good. Yeah, let's do five more. And um, um, so I, just to let people know, I've been exploring putting these up on SoundCloud. We've been getting a lot of people asking for the audio version of this or a true podcast version of this. So I'm looking into a real simple way to get this done. I don't want to take a lot of time. Um, to get it done, but I think I've got a simple way. I think I can just upload these these hangouts to SoundCloud so people can, uh, and then I can, I guess, put those on iTunes right away. So people will soon have an audio only version of this. Awesome, good, good, good. And then the other thing we wanna figure out is I think we should move the output of the, the YouTube videos should probably go into a different channel because I think they're going to your personal YouTube channel. Yeah, just, it, yeah, not even, it was like the whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we should probably set up like set up another one or something where it's more about the show. So they're in a sort of a totally. But anyway, that's something we should got to figure out. I was wondering if it's impossible to automatically put them in multiple places. I, I don't even know what's possible. I haven't looked at any of this. I don't know. I looked a little bit into that, and you start getting into this like copyright detection thing that uh -huh. Google does. I don't know if anybody has any advice about publishing these in another channel or moving them, uh, ping, ping me on, on Twitter, please, uh, and let us know if you've got some good advice about that. But yeah, I'll look into it. Awesome. Well, cool. 3.30. Good to talk to you again, and uh, we'll talk Monday. Have a great right, weekend, man. man. Yeah, we'll talk to you later. All right. Bye. Yeah. Bye.